So, alien tomb found in Russia. I don't know about this one. I might have to check it out, though, because it definitely intrigues me. But uh, I would expect that to be plastered all over every news station, play by play, if they found that. Or maybe things that's going on over there right now has overshadowed this. Maybe. Maybe it slipped through the cracks. I don't know. But we're going to figure it out. Y'all know what we do. We're going to figure things out. So we're going to check out this Alien Tomb Found in Russia video. If you're new to the channel, man, hit that subscribe button. Join the fam. We on this road to a milli, man. Shout outs to each and every one of y'all. Let's check this out. Hmm. In 1973, Eric Anton Paul von Däniken would publish a book that would change the world. Because of this publication, Eric is thought of as the pioneering advocate of the ancient astronaut theory. He was solely responsible for bringing the ancient alien hypothesis to public attention. His book, Gold of the Gods, included extensive research regarding a lost and very ancient city buried beneath most of Ecuador. In the book, he would detail talks with a man known as Janos Juan Moritz, a figure who had managed to extensively explore the abandoned ancient underground tunnel systems. The entrance to this forgotten world is entered through the Cueva de los Teos, the Teos Cave. While exploring, Janos claimed to have stumbled across a secret passage which led to rooms filled with mounds of golden jewels and coins and a golden sarcophagus placed within an intact ancient metallic library containing books made from a strange metal. Janos's research suggested that the golden fortune, along with the sarcophagus and metallic library located within the artificial tunnels, had been placed there by a lost civilization with the help of extraterrestrial beings. Did Janos Juan Moritz actually stumble upon an ancient alien tomb? A tomb which had managed to survive many thousands of years without being disturbed? Now this ain't the first time we've heard early civilizations speak about aliens, right? This ain't the first time. They've had a belief. So to say that or rule it out, maybe he came across something. Who knows? But again, like I said earlier, this ain't the first time, bro. A tomb which had managed to survive many thousands of years without being disturbed. Not only were the claims within von Däniken's book taken seriously, they resulted in the most expensive cave exploration ever undertaken. Stan Hall from Britain commenced upon this expedition in 1976 with the goal of finding the golden artifacts and hopefully an alien corpse. The expedition included over 100 people, including experts in a variety of fields, British and Ecuadorian military personnel, a film crew, and even former astronaut and first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong. The team also included eight experienced British cavers who thoroughly explored the riskier of ancient tunnel systems, successfully conducting an accurate survey of the complex, producing a detailed map of the buried city. Unfortunately, little evidence of von Däniken's more exotic claims was found or remained. It is always a possibility that funded tomb robbers made it there first. True. It took over a year for Stan True. Hall to organize his team a year which experienced a flurry of public attention directed towards what can only be described as drastically consequential claims. What's more, compounding evidence of the artifact's existence unearthed from these exact cave systems has miraculously been documented in the past. Not only had some of these mythical items been recovered, the artifacts had been bought and collected by a man known as Father Crespi. Father Crespi is considered a saint by some, he was born in Milan, Italy in 1891 and died in 1982. He was a Salesian monk who dedicated his life to worship and charity. He actually lived in the small town of Cuenca in Ecuador for more than 50 years. He did not have much wealth, but what he did have, he used to help the less fortunate. He was an avid collector of what could now be classified as impossible artifacts. He would encourage those who needed money to bring him whatever items they could find within the jungles, and he would pay them for their troubles. Smart. Although some are crude forgeries, he still paid them for their efforts. Some, however... That's crazy, bro. Even back then, people were scamming and taking advantage of people trying to help you out in your situation. 
you need money. Okay, bring me this. I'll give you money in exchange for, you know what I mean? Some valuable items. And y'all bringing them forgeries, bro. That's that's crazy. He won in the end, though, probably. Though some are crude forgeries, he still paid them for their efforts. Some, however, brought to him from within these cave systems, collaborate the stories of Eric von Däniken. Not only did these particular artifacts collaborate the story, but they were often made from solid gold, exhibited language and visually illustrated culture of an as yet unknown but clearly highly developed ancient civilization. The collection also included several metallic books inscribed with an exquisite unknown language. Upon Father Crespi's death, his collection was looted by unknown peoples. All artifacts of interest were replaced with obvious forgeries or simply stolen. Upon returning from their unsuccessful expedition, the lead researcher met with Janos Moritz's indigenous source, who claimed that they had investigated the wrong cave. Had the source been paid for his silence? What is interesting is the fact that the team's efforts were not entirely fruitless. Characteristics of the cave systems they explored match that of the descriptions given by von Däniken. What's more, they actually unearth zoological, botanical, and archaeological features, items which are unexplainable for the geographical location, unless it was visited by a group of people capable of traveling the seas far before Columbus. What do you think of the Teos Cave's legendary golden burial chamber? Was it all a hoax, or did somebody get there first? Hey guys. Now, I'm sure you're already aware of the strange incident that once occurred in the small county of Roswell, New Mexico in the year 1947. Subsequently covered up and wiped from the archives of history by the US government's Men in Black. But what many of you might not be aware of is the peculiar report made on July 15, 2008 by the Physical Sciences Department at Eastern New Mexico University in regards to an amazing discovery made at the crash site some years later by auto repairman Robert Ridge. While deer hunting in the area on the 4th of September 2004, Ridge found a chocolate-colored sandstone very close to the crash site, with a remarkable worked engraving visible on its front. It has become known as the Roswell Rock, measuring 5 centimeters by 4.3 centimeters and weighing 50.78 grams, with one end twice as thick as the other. The strange pattern has beveled edges and is raised more than an eighth of an inch up from the surface of the rock. During research attempts to decipher the pattern upon the stone, it was subsequently matched to an extraordinary crop circle, which occurred on August 2nd, 1996, at Liddington Castle in Wiltshire, England. The formation was made far away from where they found the rock, right? How, how is that a coincidence? How? And do we believe that's a rock? 96 at Liddington Castle in Wiltshire, England. The formation was made on standing wheat, yet on the rock, the pattern is not raised, but beveled, making this stone seem like a matching opposite piece to an as yet unknown puzzle. Lab test results concluded that upon the back of the stone, where three pits were visible, was likely where larger grains had fell out over time. However, a pattern was deliberately placed on the back, found with a series of embedded calcite-like crystals in the shape of an X or cross. They also discovered the stone had a strong magnetic attraction, narrowed down to the presence of magnetite. An energy dispersive fluorescence spectrometer, or EDXRF, confirmed the presence of this strange iron material. Strangely, when magnetic influence is over the thickest end of the rock, the rock turns counterclockwise. However, when above the lower crescent and circle, the thinnest end of the rock, the rock reverses and turns clockwise. Some have concluded this is a deliberately placed riddle in the form of a clue or message. Varying clockwise and counterclockwise plant lays are a fundamental characteristic of authentic crop formations worldwide. Eleven years on after he found it, Ridge thankfully still has the stone, which he states is in a safe deposit box most of the time. Apparently, he hasn't tried to- I thought he was about to tell people where he got it. Don't you tell nobody where you got that at. You hide that even from yourself at this point. 
Fam, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm glad that he still has it too, bro. Like, but what in the, how, when, where, why? Like, I, I got a lot of questions for this. To sell it, and even agreed to allow Giorgio Socalos of Ancient Aliens to do some testing on it during a 2014 special of the History Channel's In Search of Aliens. When geologist Bill Dolman suggested that Ridge allow he and Giorgio to apply a grinder to the backside of the stone in order to collect some dust for analysis, Ridge reluctantly agreed, but became clearly emotional, even tearful during the process. It would appear Ridge does in fact have a deep emotional attachment to his find, but was cooperating with the History Channel's efforts to try to learn more about it via magnetic testing, CT scanning, and spectroscopic elemental analysis. Thanks to Robert Ridge's diligent efforts, the stone remains in existence. As always, thanks for watching, guys. Take care. The Crystal Skull. I don't know if I, I'd have been emotional too. Now, we could think about, look at that in two different ways. Maybe the rock was causing him. Maybe it's, he's been around it so much that it's starting to affect his emotions as far as maybe the energy's coming from the rock or something coming from the rock tapping in. Or, like, he didn't want nobody to, to, to mess that up. He knows what he has. I'd have been emotional for that reason as well. Like, but at the same time, you're torn because you want to know what it is. You want to know what you have. You know it's valuable, but you want to know more about it. And I'm interested to see what they learn from that, though. I'm going to have to go look that up. That's in, that is very, very interesting. And I'm surprised, like, the government hasn't tried to get that off of him. Take it from him. You know, the men in black show up at your door with the little flashy thing and try to flashy thing you. Your memory. <laughs> if him, I would get off the grid. Off the grid. That is crazy, though. A set of the world's most alluring artifacts, possessing the power to create religions, snaring many a Hollywood figure with their mysticism and rumored possible alien origins. Firstly, how does one tell a real crystal skull from a fake? There are always artists capable of making and selling things that seem old, says anthropologist Jane McLaren Walsh of the Smithsonian Museum. Unfortunately. And she should know. Walsh has seen her share of fakes. In fact, she's probably seen more crystal skulls than anyone else alive, subsequently becoming the leading academic on the subject. A stern skeptic with a ruthless ethic, only the most puzzling will convince Jane. Another major player in the skull game, according to Walsh, was Frederick Arthur Mitchell Hedges, an English stockbroker turned adventurer, who in 1943 began displaying a skull at dinner parties which he called the Skull of Doom. His daughter Anna later claimed that he'd found the skull in a ruined temple in Belize during the early 1920s. However, this was later found to have been a lie. Investigations by the Linnean Society of London, a research institute specializing in taxonomy and natural history, revealed that Mitchell Hedges actually purchased his skull at auction at Sotheby's in London in 1943. How it came to be at the auction house, however, was never established. Which is unfortunate, because the Mitchell Hedges skull, according to Walsh's scrupulous examination, is the only one she has ever had to reluctantly confirm as an authentic crystal skull. What's more, it is the only academically accepted original known within the public archives. Smaller than other examples, which under microscope analysis were seen to have been made using rotary drills, the Mitchell Hedges skull is a more finely crafted, yet more crudely designed example that under the atomic microscope has shown signs of having indeed been an ancient pre-Columbian artifact, which sure enough was constructed using, quote, unknown technology. There are of course many examples of crystal skulls around the world, and many more stories surrounding their mysterious construction. Elongated examples, stories of groups of these skulls initiating some form of energy field, Ancient laser cutting technology has also been claimed time and time again. However, we felt we would approach them from another angle to experience the rare occasion when modern, specifically funded academic institutes buckle to overwhelming evidence, proofs given by the defeated skeptic to those who pursue nothing but the perplexing truth and a direction for study. Made from a single piece of quartz crystal, 
Mitchell's Skull of Doom is unquestionably an exquisite example of an unknown history here upon our planet. Regardless of beliefs or indeed the superstitions which now surround them, there are a rare few which support the theory of lost civilization and ancient visitation. This skull is much smaller than many and crudely carved, leading museum scholars here to believe that in a world of fakes, this one is the real thing. Now, I would have looked at this one in first glance, I would have been like, all right, that's a fake. That's a fake. But no, possibly not. And this is coming from the Smithsonian Channel. Believe that in a world of fakes, this one is the real thing. That's the, that's the end of it, huh? Hold on, we gonna have like two minutes left in the video. Oh, it's got more y'all. I was about to say, let me get to it. 1973, Romania. Workers near the Muir River would uncover an aluminum artifact buried with the remains of two large prehistoric mastodons. In a place known as Aird, about 35 feet deep in the sand, a metal fragment was unearthed, a fragment that would subsequently be covered up by the Romanian government for over 30 years. Ira Kohal, the deputy director of the Romanian Ufologists Association, said, Laboratory tests originally concluded that it was most likely an old UFO fragment, given that the substances it comprised that cannot be combined with technologies available on Earth, even to this day. The artifact is now on display in the History Museum of Kulinapoke, with a sign saying, Origin still unknown. The Archaeological Institute of Kulinapoke, who examined it, found it to be made of an alloy of aluminum encased in a thin layer of oxide, composed of 12 different elements. It is 89% aluminum covered by a thick oxide layer. The thickness of this layer is said to be confirmation of the object's immense age. Many skeptics have attempted to explain the artifact away as an elaborate hoax, yet none seem to be able to explain how. This how you know I love this type of stuff. Even with them, I don't know what's going on with the voice for this portion of the video, and it sounded funny. I'm still watching and locked into it because this stuff is so fascinating to me, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, no matter what the voice is saying, I'm still listening. Even more interesting is the fact that recently in Russia, a very similar aluminium artifact has been discovered embedded in a lump of coal. Lighting the fire during a cold winter evening, a resident of Vladivostok found a rail-shaped piece of metal embedded in one of the pieces of coal. Mesmerized by his discovery, the responsible citizen decided to seek help from scientists of Primary Region. After the metal object was studied by the leading experts, the man was shocked to learn about the assumed age of his discovery. The metal detail was dated at 300 million years old, and the scientists suggest that it was not created by nature but was rather manufactured by an intelligent force. This fragment has been found to be made of a similar composition to the Wedge of Air. Are these artifacts proof of visitation by aliens to our planet? Or maybe revealing of our own advanced history? Hopefully one day their mysterious origins will be understood. Now imagine how many more things out there are like that. 300 million years ago? Sheesh. Sheesh. And it wasn't made from nature. So that, and then you got to go back. Okay, when did humans arrive here on the planet? You got to go through everything in that timeline and start figuring out, okay, if humans wasn't here yet, then who made this if it didn't come from nature? Interesting. Hmm. Good question. Listen, man, y'all get at me in the comment section. Let me know what you thought about this video, man. Alien tomb found in Russia and uh, some more stuff. It's your boy L, man. Till the next reaction, I'm gone. Peace.